1850 and the way people live. Why, I remember when I was a lad, born in Massachusetts, I was, about the time of the war ending. In those days, most everything was made by hand. Each family would spin its own thread. It was all a family could do to weave its own cloth, sew its own clothes, and raise enough food to keep itself growing. Few machines. But we did have Yankee ingenuity, and we were always ready to try new things. In our house, we had one of those new heating stoves invented by Ben Franklin. Mr. Franklin had pioneered many new American ideas back about 1750. His experiments with electricity led to the invention of the lightning rod. In Rhode Island, I saw my first real machine when I was 10 years old. Sent into the town of Pawtucket, I was apprenticed to a school. They called it a school, but we children worked the new spinning machines in the factory. These machines have been preserved in museums because they were the beginning of the textile industry in the United States. The ideas for these machines came from England, where new factories were spinning thread and making cloth. A young Englishman named Sam Slater filled his head with details, came to this country, and from memory built these spinning jennies. The machines spun so fast they almost ran out of cotton in New England. Cotton was scarce in those days. It grew well in the South, but cleaning out the seeds was a chore. They needed a better way to get the cotton ready for our spinning mills. The invention that filled the need, the cotton gin, was built in just five weeks by Eli Whitney, a Yankee schoolteacher visiting in Georgia. This was one of the first important American inventions, patented in 1794. In a few short years, the South was growing 50 times as much cotton as before the gin. And in the North, industry grew. What with the factories spinning and the farms ginning, we put Ma's hand spinning wheel out of business. Machine cloth was cheap enough for everyone. And better, too. But our New England water power was not enough. To meet the needs of more and faster machines, a new kind of power came into use. Steam. We had heard about the marvelous steam engines of Mr. James Watt in England. His first was a pump to lift water out of coal mines. Then about 1782, he hitched the steam to a shaft and a wheel that could turn other wheels for power. But even before steam began to power our mills and factories, it moved us on the water, at first along the Hudson River. Mr. Robert Fulton planned a steamboat called the Claremont, built her in 1807. Steamboats made travel and shipping easier, helped spread the nation west. I know. In 1810, I took my family on the Claremont from Albany to New York, starting on our journey west. Travel was much harder on the land. It was a long journey for many of us across Pennsylvania to the Ohio River. Here, where we struck water again, we built ourselves a flatboat and floated all our belongings down the lazy current. The river brought many settlers down into Ohio. With more settlers needing goods like salt and iron and wanting to ship crops back east, the Ohio and Mississippi rivers heard a new sound around the bend. The steamboat made us feel that the cities of the East were closer. We were one nation instead of a group of states. Thousands more came West, until for some of us, it got crowded in Ohio. So we headed West again, 
out here to Illinois, where plenty of good land is to be had for the settling. Land so every son can have his own farm. And there was another machine that spread people into the West, the steam locomotive. From many inventors in England and the United States came locomotives. Stevenson's rocket. There was the John Bull. The Lafayette, why, they went miles an hour sometimes. The DeWitt Clinton backed into Albany, New York, and gave regular service to Schenectady. The railroads grew and connected with each other, first in the east, of course, but soon reaching out to where we needed them to cover the great distances in the west. Life moves fast in our year of 1850. Why, just over here a piece, they've strung electric wires for that new telegraph invented by Samuel Morse. In 1850, telegraph wires reach across all our states to the Mississippi River and down to the Deep South. Why, a letter might take a whole week to get back east, but now news travels fast. The end of the Mexican War, for instance, was on the telegraph to our newspapers soon after it happened. The invention of the telegraph has helped the railroads grow. They can keep track of their trains and help prevent wrecks. Businessmen buy and sell on the telegraph. Why, these slender wires tie our nation together. Yes, machines mean a lot to us in 1850. What will this reaper do for us? Well, we need a good machine for cutting wheat. A good man can harvest about one acre a day if he starts before sunup. But some years, harvest time is only a few days long. Still, with the high price wheat brings back east, a man might plant a hundred acres, even if he loses some harvesting by hand. Well, let's see about this reaper. It came from Cyrus McCormick's new factory in Chicago. They're building them by the hundreds. The agent says it's much improved over that first reaper that McCormick built in Virginia in 1831. Can this funny-looking rig really harvest our wheat? And it does. Five times as fast as a harvest hand with a cradle. It's easy to see that farms will get bigger. Wheat will be cheaper. With machines like this, there's no limit to how much we can grow. We'll make this prairie land the breadbasket of the world. Yes, machines have brought us a long way since I tended those spinning jennies back in Rhode Island. Who knows? Someday there may even be machines for sewing. Lots of reasons have made the United States grow so fast and so strong. But it never would have happened without our machines and inventions. And this grandson of mine, what will those excited eyes see in his time? By the 20th century, 